This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director and the Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land, and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors. So a very warm welcome to you all tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre, Match Studio and the University of South Australia, to the Visualising Mental Health Forum as we reflect today on World Mental Health Day, but personally I think as we should every day. I would like to thank Dr Jane Andrew and your amazing team at Match Studio for all your work in bringing tonight's forum together and the Visualising Mental Health exhibition in the Hawke Centre's Gary Packer Civic Gallery. And also a big thank you to the Uni SA students um, for all your wonderful work and um, commitment to this project and congratulations to you all. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a diverse and free program of events and exhibitions throughout the year which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. The session tonight is actually being filmed and a video will be available on the Hawke Centre website next week. So please share with fellow students, colleagues, friends that may be interested. So as we are recording, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent? Um, but for those of you who would like to join the Twitter conversation, please use the links on the screen behind me. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Dr Jane Andrew, founding director of Match Studio, to talk about the Visualising Mental Health Project and to introduce our student um, presenters and guest speakers. Thank you. Thanks Jacinta and the uh, Hawke Centre team for supporting us put on the Visualising Mental Health Forum and Exhibition. It's the fourth year running. Wow, time flies when you're having fun, but literally it is a really great project to work on. So also welcome to you all and thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to acknowledge a number of people here with us tonight. Thanks to uh, Mr Chris Burns, South Australia's Mental Health Commissioner, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later. Juliet McMillan, Associate Director, Community Engagement at the South Australian Health Commission. Professor Nancy Arthur, Associate Dean of, the Division of Research of the Division of Education, Arts and Social Sciences here at UniSA. Associate Professor Veronica Kelly, Dean Academic, Division of Education, Arts and Social Science here. Associate Professor Jane Lawrence, Head of School, Art, Architecture and Design. I'd really like to acknowledge the Create Design team who aren't here tonight because they work from interstate, but they have uh, created the wonderful Visualising Mental Health website um, that anybody can engage in, and especially uh, researchers and professionals within, within the field. A special acknowledgement goes to the Visualising Mental Health academic team. Um, the staff are led by Dr Doreen Donovan, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, she's overseas presenting at a conference. But Nikki, Christopher, Linda and Melinda um, all contribute to enabling the students to develop these fantastic concepts that you will see up in the gallery and also hear from some of the students tonight. That brings me to the students. Um, the final year communication design students are set with numerous challenges throughout the final year of their studies and it's a credit to them the commitment and effort that they put into developing the designs um, for any of the projects but especially this one for visualising mental health project. So without whom this project would not exist without these students so thank you very much to them. So mental ill health touches us all 
It can challenge us personally, our loved ones and friends, excuse me, our work colleagues. <coughs> the impacts of mental health affect our communities and society more broadly. No matter where and how it touches our lives, communication is key to addressing the personal challenges caused by mental ill health, the stigma surrounding mental ill health, and also importantly, the promotion of mental fitness. Communication is key. So it's this communication challenge that Match Studio has given to final year communication design students. So Match Studio's focus is to develop and facilitate industry-linked interdisciplinary project learning opportunities where students get to work with clients and researchers to address real world challenges. They're not designing for themselves. They're designing something that they intend will make a difference for their client and most importantly for the people who engage with their designs. So the prototypes you see up in the gallery are a demonstration of Match Studio's intention of enabling students to work on real world projects, taking the designs off the page and into the real world. So as I said, working with real world clients is critical in Match Studio doing what it does. So thanks to the ongoing commitment from Dr. Gareth Ferber, a passionate and committed change maker, our student teams are able to base their designs on credible research and connect with clinicians he invites to come in and provide feedback to students through the development of their ideas and who also join us at the student's final presentation for assessment. So it's Gareth's um, professional peers uh, that provide us with the topics that students have addressed for their communication challenge. So this year, there was a really big class of final year visual communication students. We had 22 teams. Linda, how many students were in the whole group? About 70 students in total. Big number of students. 10 of these teams were shortlisted for awards. So in a minute, we're going to hear from two of those teams. But before that, we'd like to present a small number of awards. So as I call you, your, you and your team out, um, those of you that are here, come up and accept the award. So third place goes to No Shit. I didn't swear. That was, that's the name of the concept, No Shit. So can Ruby, Jamie, Chelsea, Michaelia please come up and accept your award. Would you like to accept them on behalf of the others? <laughs> I'll give you the bundle. So. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> the South Australian Health Commission honourable mention goes to Felians. So would Felians team like to join us please? Liana, I'm sorry. There's so many of them, I mean, they don't know people's names. <laughs> okay. A special commendation goes to Humpty, the Great Fall. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll give you two. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. See you. So now to the uh, second and first place getters who are going to present their concepts to us. I'd like to ask the Mother in the Making team, Olivia, Winona, Sophie and Hannah, to share with us their design. Mother in the Making is a reflective prompt journal designed to help new mothers begin the emotionally complex journey into motherhood. In our initial research, we discovered that postnatal depression affects one in five new mothers and one in 10 fathers. 
Whilst we did not centre this project around postnatal depression, we endeavoured to come up with an emotional aid aimed at making the transition to life with a newborn a little bit easier. Through the use of reflective written exercises and alternative methods such as drawing and colouring in, the journal gets mothers to spend time exploring key emotions that they have been feeling. This aids in the identification of any issues that they may need to seek further support for. Writing about difficult experiences in Mother in the Making provides a private space to explore more challenging emotions. This also gives new mothers the ability to show their journal to a partner or a medical professional, especially if they feel unable to express their emotions verbally. Mother in the Making also celebrates all that new mothers have achieved. Self-confidence and resilience building exercises ask mothers to recall things that they have achieved, no matter how big or small. Our journal is designed to be distributed in conjunction with the Blue Book. This is a developmental milestone book given to the parents of newborns in South Australia. Mother in the Making offers a renewed focus on the mental health and emotional needs of new mothers. Based on this model, there is space to develop targeted journals for fathers, single parents, same-sex parents, teens, and parents who have lost a newborn, developing a package that supports all new parents. From our precedent research, we discovered that there's an abundance of information presented in single-page formats, which were most often text-heavy and overwhelming. Additionally, much of the information was about looking after a baby. As a result of this, we saw a major need for a targeted approach to prioritise the mental health of mothers. When considering the most appropriate avenue to encourage, mo encourage mothers to explore their emotional feelings, we focused on strategies that could be implemented into a mother's routine, such as an interactive, such as an interactive, um, an interactive toy for the newborn or a storybook with emotional cues for adults. The personal and in-depth nature of the journal proved to be the most suitable format for the exploration of emotions experienced by new mums. By utilising a warm and positive colour palette, the journal creates a calm and safe atmosphere for mothers to write about their personal thoughts. The typeface selection mimics the handwritten component of the journal, keeping the entries and overall feel very informal to minimise any feelings of stress when filling out the pages. The nonlinear structure of the journal enables mothers to open to a page that resonates with them and fill in what they can. The content of the journal enables mothers to formulate a record of their emotional landscape without necessarily having to remember key dates or events in their ever busy schedules. The prototype, our prototype provides new mothers with the, with the opportunity to develop a routine that involves time to reflect and check in on their emotions. Mother in the Making creates impact not only through its specialised design, but also in the way that it engages new mothers. Engagement with the journal can highlight any potential struggles and prompt mothers to reach out before these emotions become a larger issue. The journal works as a record of the mother's mental state and can assist health professionals in identifying any symptoms of postnatal and or depression. Postnatal depression and or anxiety, sorry. Mother in the Making aims to create a healthy environment where a mother's mental health is as important as the general health of her newborn. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Don't go away. So... Congratulations, everybody. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Can't get out of it that easily. So, now to the winning team, whose design will be prototyped thanks to the support of the South Australian Health Commission. Taking designs from the two-dimensional form into the real world is vitally important to enable designers to understand how their work can make an impact. So we're going to be producing the designs, the Monster Me, Monster Me designs um, as a prototype. So I would really like to welcome the team up to present their concept to us.
Hello, and welcome to our presentation of the mobile application Monster Me for the Visualizing Mental Health Exhibition. My name is Kimberly Molina, and this is Amelia Nichols and Chloe Yao, and we are the communication designers behind this project. Mental fitness relates to our personal well-being that impacts how we think and feel. Practicing good mental fitness habits will improve our mental health and quality of life. Mental health is just as important as physical health. People strive to improve their physical health through exercise and going to the gym, but fail to do the same for their mental health, which can lead to general unhappiness or depression. We often are not taught ways to improve our mental well-being until there is a problem that requires attention. Monster Me aims to introduce appropriate mental fitness strategies to our target audience, children, which are otherwise not taught and can result in poor mental fitness habits developing and affecting their well-beings later in life. Actions have consequences, and teaching children appropriate actions will assist them in understanding how to value and care for their mental health. The mobile application features taking care of a monster in a virtual room. Both the room and the monster is customizable. The user must take care of the monster by maintaining a variety of stats. If the health stats become depleted, the monster takes on an unpleasant visual effect to signify as such and can only be removed upon erasing the stats once again. The game features a currency in the form of footsteps. The app can track how far the phone travels and translates that into footsteps. This can then be used to purchase items for raising stats and further customization. The app also features the ability to communicate with the monster. The monster will ask the user questions when clicked on or prompt. This can generally be just about how the user is feeling. Not only can this be used as a way for the user to reflect on their well-being, but it can establish a friendship between the user and the monster, which can be a comforting source for some users. The game, if the child plays correctly, makes sure the monster's health bars are an attractive, bright green color. The child will learn that by making appropriate decisions that they will potentially have stumbled upon some very resilient coping and problem-solving skills, all while having fun and learning about that actions have consequences. Special attention was made to our screen images to obtain a careful balances of images and options that appeal to children. And from our precedent researching and investigating other games with similar motives to Monster Me, we have found games that hold similar ideas. And we looked at these games, such as Tamagotchi, The Sims, and Pokemon Go. And from these games, we determined the best of their elements and added more relevant mental fitness strategies to define and develop the content for Monster Me. The point of difference between what is currently available and our new game, Monster Me, is the game is aimed at taking fun elements from popular games and adding more relevant mental fitness strategies. Monster Me creates impact by encouraging healthy mental fitness patterns early in life, which will enable users to understand the importance of valuing mental health. Making the right choices will have a positive impact on child's overall health. The unexpected bonus of Monster Me is that through the various customization options, it can mirror the player's personality and habits as every creation is unique. This prompts their creativity and will overall help to improve the child's mood. The footsteps feature encourages physical activity, while the maintenance of stats shows how everyday actions have an impact on your mental health. Users will learn the importance of taking care of these needs in order to develop healthy mental fitness habits and demonstrate that actions have consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Congratulations. Okay. Congratulations, everybody. Oops, dropped that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Nicholas Proctor to join us. Uh, thank you very much, Jane, and, and uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. I'd like to also acknowledge people in the audience here tonight with lived experience and their carers and loved ones. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. My name's Nicholas Proctor. I'm from the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Research Group uh, in the Division of Health Sciences. 
It's also my pleasure to um, welcome and introduce Chris Burns, South Australian Mental Health Commissioner, South Australian Mental Health Commission. Chris Burns, CSC, is a passionate advocate for strengthening the mental well-being of his fellow South Australians. He has been the South Australian Mental Health Commissioner for the past three years. Chris is involved with people from all walks of life and organisations, ranging from government, private sector, non-government, uh, non-government sector, as he spreads the important message that good mental health starts with strong, inclusive communities and early intervention and promotion and prevention, rather than simply acute care in emergency departments. Chris has prioritised and incorporated the views of many South Australians as he led the development of the South Australian Mental Health Strategic Plan 2017 to 2022. Chris and his team are now implementing the strategic plan. Central to Chris's work at the Commission is ongoing mental health reform and ensuring that people with lived experience of mental illness and their families and carers are provided with improved services. Please join me to make Chris welcome. Well, thanks very much, Nick. Thanks very much, Nick, and uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, can I also uh, reflect uh, Jacinta's acknowledgement that we meet uh, today on the traditional custodians uh, of this land, the Kaurna people, and also reflect uh, Nick's acknowledgement of all of those in this room who have lived experience of mental illness, uh, consumers, carers and clinicians, and as I'll demonstrate shortly, that's virtually everyone in this room. It's pretty hard not to be. I've been asked to uh, just give some words on why uh, today National Mental Health Day is so important to us at the Mental Health Commission, but more importantly, uh, why we were so keen to be involved with Matt's studio. And can I congratulate uh, the winners, the finalists, and everyone who participated in the Matt Studio event. Um, it was fascinating uh, to learn about it. When we were first briefed on it, uh, there was no hesitation. We wanted to be part of it because it so perfectly aligns with what we're trying to do at the Mental Health Commission. I often reflect on the words of uh, Ronald Kessler, um, and he talks there about um, that it's like practising 1950s cardiology, uh, where they waited for the heart attack to occur and then they knew what to do. In some ways, in mental health and wellbeing, in a lot of ways, um, that's what we do. Uh, we're waiting for the mind attack to occur. Effectively, the ambulance is at the bottom of the cliff, uh, waiting for the crisis to occur. And what we've realised in the Mental Health Commission is we have to get away from that paradigm and we have to stop uh, people falling over the cliff and the crisis occurring. Um, Nick mentioned that we went out and uh, developed a strategic plan for mental health and wellbeing in South Australia. When we went out, uh, we consulted with over 2,000 South Australians. We thought what we would hear is that people who are mentally unwell spend too long in the emergency department, um, they, there's not enough beds, and you can't get an appointment with a psychiatrist. We heard very, very little of that uh, we went out. What we heard out there was uh, people are lonely. Uh, we've lost our sense of community connection. We need to break down the stigma and discrimination that's associated with mental illness. And we can only do that by raising awareness and educating people. And importantly, we need to focus on promotion, prevention and early intervention. And so based on that consultation, we developed this vision uh, for South Australia. And I'm not going to read all of it, but key to it is we want to be interna internationally recognised as a resilient, compassionate and connected community. Because that's what South Australians told us they wanted. And ultimately, through all that, it's about strengthening and building the mental health and wellbeing of South Australians to grow our mental wealth as a state. And so we're quite proud that that's the vision uh, that sets the scene for the strategic plan that we produced. To put it in a bit of context, um, what I'd like to just set the scene is by talking about the health ecosystem, because it's important to understand how the ecosystem works 
in order to understand where the prevalence occurs and how we better address the issues involved. Um, the foundation of good mental health and wellbeing is based on the social determinants. If a person has a good job, they can earn an income, they have a roof over their house, a roof over their head, I should say, and they can house their family. They can provide them with a meal that night if they've got good physical fitness and health, and most importantly, if they're surrounded by a strong group of community, colleagues and friends and family, then their mental health and well-being will be strong and they will be mentally well. The challenge is, when one of those social determinants breaks down, then the individual's mental health and well-being is impacted. So our thinking is, let's go back to looking at it from a social determinants perspective, not just the clinical perspective where you wait for the crisis to occur. The next layer is where we work on how do we prevent the various things that impact people becoming unwell. And there's the obvious uh, 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 drug use, alcohol, tobacco, but that's the promotion and prevention and early intervention layer. How do we stop the crisis occurring? But when people do start to become unwell, uh, they then rely on the primary health system, uh, our GPs, um, allied health pharmacies, to deal uh, with what might be becoming mental illness. And then um, there, are, there is that percentage uh, that do become in need of acute care, and they rely on the secondary system. So that just sets the scene of the ecosystem so that we get it all in context. Let's just have a look at the pre prevalence. Um, uh, at any time, 3% of the population are at that severe end of the spectrum where they're in need of inpatient uh, acute care. Uh, the next layer down is the 4.6% who are in that need of that primary care, that subacute outpatient type of care. But the vast bulk of the majority of the population are mild, at risk, or in, in the case of well, 60% of the population are well at any point in time. So for us at the Mental Health Commission, what we think is actually the primary and secondary health systems are working particularly well. Um, they're looking after that top 10% of the population that need their care. What we need to do as a commission is focus on the, the other 90%. How do we get that promotion, prevention, early intervention, raising awareness and educating people to break down the stigma and discrimination? So that's how we focus and that's why you might see why we see such a linkage with Match Studio and uh, the various solutions that came out. Um, the other important thing is that, that people don't go from being well all the way up to severe uh, and back down again. Uh, you can go from well to at risk and back to well again. And it fluctuates for every individual, uh, or sometimes on a daily basis. So it's not an extreme where you go all the way to the top and then come back down again. When I talk about well-being, I think it's important uh, that we have an understanding of what well-being means. And this goes back to those social determinants I was talking about. And it's that whole of person perspective. It's about not only their psychological, but their physiological, their social, their cultural, their emotional. And they are influenced by all those social determinants I mentioned before, about having physical activity, having a job, having a roof over their head, uh, knowing where their next feed is, and most importantly, being surrounded by a good, strong community. So that sets the scene uh, for why we at the Mental Health Commission are looking for every way we can get the message out there that promotion, prevention and early intervention impacts the, the vast majority of the population and prevents the crisis occurring. And that's why we were so keen to be involved in Match Studio. But I wanted to do something that visualised mental health for you. And uh, so I'm going to take a bit from the, the winners, the Monster app, uh, and we're going to go through some stats. And I'll hopefully use the stats to impress on you uh, what the prevalence of mental illness is and how it impacts our society and why it is so important. 
So I'm going to show the numbers. If anyone wants to call out what they think the number relates to, uh, they can do it, but then we'll get on to explain what the number means. First number is number three. Anyone want to have a crack? This is interactive, you see. I'm trying to be like Max Studios. Three. The human brain starts developing three weeks after conception. That's when the opportunity starts to impact the mental health and well-being of a human being. And that says to us that if we're not reaching out and impacting people pre-conception and immediately after conception, we're not starting that promotion, prevention and early intervention regime early enough. Five? Any cracks? Where's all the research you guys did? <laughs> five. 90% of human brain development occurs in the first five years of life. That's when a child is, working, is, is living with their family uh, and their local community. They're not in school at this stage. So if 90% of brain development occurs in that first five years of life, that's where we've got to focus on ensuring they have good mental health and well-being going into the future. Forty-five. This is the big one. People should know this. Any chances? OK. Close. 45% um, of South Australians will experience a diagnosable mental illness in their life. That's almost half of us are going to experience a diagnosable mental illness in our life. For about half of them, it'll be anxiety and depression related. So by my maths, what's 55%? 55% of South Australians are going to have to care for someone who's experiencing a diagnosable mental illness. Um, they may care for that person numerous times, often unknowingly, and they may care for a number of people throughout their lives who are experiencing diagnosable mental illness. So 45, 55, to me, that's 100%. So everyone in this room, at some stage in your life, will be infected, impacted by someone experiencing a diagnosable mental illness. So. Mental health and well-being is an issue for every Australian, not just a small population group, not an age group, not a unique group of, of human beings, every one of us. Going up by 10. Anyone want to have a crack at 65? So I said 45% of South Australians will experience a diagnosable mental illness in their life. Of that 45%, 65% won't, can't or don't access the help and supports they need to treat that illness. Now that could be due to isolation in remote and uh, rural locations, but more often than not, it's because of the stigma and discrimination. People don't want to go to a doctor or to a clinician and say, I need help. The blokes my age in the room, yes, you, Derek, it's us. We're the guys that won't go and seek help. So we need to get the message out there. If people are feeling unwell, then they need to seek support and help. 20? Come on, I'm not winning today. In any year, 20% of South Australians will experience a diagnosable mental illness. One in five. So it would be fair to say that in this room at the moment, one in five people are experiencing a diagnosable illness at the moment, mental illness at the moment. 14. I don't think these people did their research. OK, I said 45% of South Australians will experience a diagnosable mental illness in their life. For half of that 45%, that mental illness will onset before the age of 14. 
primarily in the age group 11 to 14. That's when the transition uh, from childhood to teenagehood occurs. Uh, come to understand mature concepts like grief, uh, transitioning from primary to high, starting to feel pressures and stresses on life, and it's in that 11 to 14 tone. That tells us if you're not focusing in that first 14 years of a human being's life, you're missing the opportunity to prevent them getting to crisis. I've already said that, haven't I? 75. For that 45% who do experience a diagnosable mental illness in their life, 75% of them, the mental illness will onset before the age of 24. So if we don't reach out and help people in that first quarter century of life, we're missing the chance to help three quarters of the population who are going to be impacted by a diagnosable mental illness. So those first 25 years of life are so very, very important. And using old and traditional methods of trying to reach out to people don't work. That's why we need things like Match Studio, where you get the youth to come out with their ideas, who know their generation, who try different innovative ways to get a message through. That's why Match Studio is so important to us. Last one. Anyone? Um, sad way to finish. Each day, eight Australians lose their life by suicide. Uh, and that's, any suicide is just tragic. But to think that each day we lose eight Australians uh, to suicide. Best estimates are for every suicide, death by suicide, uh, there could be up to 30 attempts. And for every suicide, at least 100 people are impacted. Family, friend, colleagues, community. That's what we have to address. We have to get those numbers down. So, what are we about? This is about building the fence at the top of the cliff. So that, yes, we recognise we'll always need the ambulance there for that 3% and that 4% who are in need of clinical care and help. But we can't ignore the other 90% who, if we apply uh, promotion, prevention and early intervention practices and techniques, we can stop them becoming unwell and we can stop them reaching the point of crisis. So once again, uh, we're looking for the slip, slop, slap of mental health and wellbeing. And for us, Match Studio is one of the ways that we can look at doing that in new and innovative ways with the modern generation who are the people we want to reach out to and help. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Chris, thank you so much for that. And if you could stay with us, we'll move to the panel segment. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Gareth Ferber and Jane Andrew back. Jane and Gareth will take seats and we'll move to uh, a panel opportunity for some discussion. And uh, we also hope that we'll be able to open it up for some questions for the audience. So start thinking about your questions now. Um, so perhaps I might start with Jane and Gareth, and, and I, I don't mind who goes first, you can decide that. Um, what was the catalyst for initiating the Visualising Mental Health Program back in 2016? I'm going to let Gareth do okay. that, because you All made right. the approach. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, essentially it comes down to uh, this idea that psychology as a discipline has been very valuable for me. So it's been very valuable in terms of it, it's been my career um, and the principles and the ideas that I've learned along the way have been very helpful in my life in general. Um, but at the time, in 2016, I was working in research, so I didn't really have an avenue through which to communicate 
uh, what I had learned to a broader audience. Um, and then I discovered that, uh, I discovered Match Studio that was actually within the university at the stage um, and thought, what better way to try and think about some innovative and interesting ways to communicate mental health concepts than to hang out with designers. So uh, I would consider myself to be a, a, um, a wannabe artist, someone who, who would really love to have some of those uh, visual design skills, mm. but doesn't. Um, and the, the, the mechanisms by which I do my communication are fairly dry, writing, um, presentations, things like that. So it was an opportunity to actually give the ideas to students who had um, a much greater imagination and weren't held back in the same way as I might be in terms of the communication mechanisms mm -hmm. that I would use. Mm -hmm. um, and reaching a large audience, the mm -hmm. opportunity to do stuff that talks to tens of or thousands of or potentially yeah. millions of people um, versus what I trained in, which was working maybe one or two people at a time at best. Mm. And, and Jane, can you take us back to 2016? What were you well, thinking? Well, I think Matt Studio um, was doing a lot of work um, within health professions, well, with health professionals. We were being asked to do a lot of projects, not just with mental health, but with, with other um, health professions. And uh, we decided to run a forum because what we were doing often at, at these at a number of meetings was saying to people, oh, have you come across so-and-so? They're doing some fantastic work um, in the area that you're interested in. I'll, I'll introduce you. And then I thought, nah, this is crazy, doing this one by one. Let's hold a forum and actually talk about some of these issues in the bigger audience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it was at that forum that you, you attended and, and came up to me afterwards. So it's been a wonderful relationship ever since. And what about the impact over time on prototypes, the materials that have been generated? What, what can you share with us about that? Well, I guess, as I said before, it's really important for designers and especially emerging mm. designers to see their, their ideas and their concepts um, be translated into, into real life. So mm. prototypes are, are really important. And it, as anybody knows, um, scientists or anybody testing a product before it goes to market is, really, is, is also very important. So the prototyping process um, it is something that Match Studio really tries to seek support for and sponsorship mm. for because it costs costs us money to do. Um, two of the prototypes are upstairs, and so those of you in the audience who think you may mm. be able to test out a couple of prototypes, a, a pre-test mm. prototype, um, please come up and see one of the Match Studio team uh, afterwards, and we'll provide you. We've got ten to give to people, providing you give us some mm. feedback. So that's. Gareth, you've been mentoring students through the program. Um, what are some of the highlights? What are some of the key takeaways for you in the mentorship? Um, a few parts. So uh, one is every year there will be ideas that students come up with that I can't have possibly have fathomed um, would, would emerge. Um, that's the highlight for me, is wandering around that room. And, and it's often more than one project that I think I would never have arrived at this point mm. um, through my own thinking or through discussion within my own discipline. And mm. that's not I'm saying anything negative about my own discipline, mm. but merely that um, we didn't have that kind of language or that mm. kind of way of thinking about concepts. Mm. Um, and the other part that's been really good is in the first year, um, I sort of played a fairly strong role in coming up with the topics and some colleagues helped me with the mentoring. But over time what's happened is other psychologists have come in, there's a few in the audience, um, who have brought their own topics to students and that's opened up the process even further mm. um, because you, now you've got two or three psychologists putting their ideas in and bouncing those off the students. Um, and it, it seems strange to say, but I'm able to back off a little bit and see the process just um, work on its own um, with different students and different psychologists mm. coming together mm. each year. Um, and the other thing in terms of prototyping, in the first year I had no concept that anything that we created as part of this process would go anything beyond a concept. So I thought it was a, you know, a really good playground for thinking about ideas, um, but the amazing thing for me is just the fact that we're even in this room at the moment um, talking about this 
that there are prototypes, like Jane said, up in the gallery that clinicians can take away with them tonight and actually try out. Um, that's kind of mind-blowing for me. And what have been some of the impacts? What have you seen in, among practicing psychologists? Um, I'd say we're pretty early uh, in that stage. So uh, this year is, is like the first year where we'll have an actual tangible product that clinicians can take uh, maybe into the therapy room or just into their general lives and, and use. Uh, so we're just at the process of starting to get that feedback. What I have noticed though is I, I never get any kind of negative feedback about the process as a whole. So I'm, I'm continually approached by psychologists in the mm. field who want to be involved or are interested or, or play a role in it. Mm. And then when we bring the materials out or we meet them in the gallery and we're chatting with them, um, they're standing there with a, a glass of wine and a nibble in their hand really uh, quite amazed at what they're seeing. Mm. Mm. So that's the other exciting aspect now is we're moving to a point where yes, we're going to start measuring some real-world impacts. Right. And Chris, with the South Australian Mental Health Commission, what led the Commission to take part and embrace the program? Um, right from the very start when we started developing the strategic plan, uh, the one thing I learned was uh, listen to the voice of lived experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and the phrase, nothing about us without us, mm -hmm. just resonated so strongly uh, within the Commission. And we, we had to provide every possible opportunity for people to provide their feedback and provide their input. So we said, you tell us whatever you've got to say in whatever form you like. Uh, we got cartoons, we got artwork, uh, we got emails, we got Facebook posts, uh, and one lovely lady sent us a letter. Uh, and was very grateful that we put a, a letterbox there to, to go to. But the fact was, every person we consulted had a new approach and a new thought and a new insight to mental health and wellbeing. And so that just demonstrated to us that there's no limit on the methods and the messages that you need to get out there about mental health and wellbeing. Um, so when we saw how Match Studio mm. was innovative and looking for new ways to get out there and do that promotion and the prevention and early intervention, uh, we just jumped at it mm. and saw this was the generation we wanted to, t to hear from and we want to hear what are the new <laughs> ways of getting the message out. And I've got to tell you, we certainly weren't disappointed this year, I can tell you. Jane, I might just bring you in at sure. this point because you've, I mean, had developed a close relationship with the Mental Health Commission. Mm -hmm. and how important is that relationship, the sponsorship for the work of Match Studio? Well, it's critical. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the, the fourth year that we've run it and, and mm. our relationship is really just starting to, to, to gain some traction. Mm. Um, so it's absolutely critical. Mm. Um, and it's really important for students to be able to, to mm. see that, that the things that they are mm. designing are valuable mm. and there's nothing else, that, you know, that speaks as well as having money put into something that you've created. And it's obviously a public dialogue. I mean, there's an information exchange. It's about building capacity within the sector. Absolutely. And Gareth, what, what can you say about that? What, how important is it to have events like this, have this dialogue happening about mental health? You know, talk us through why that's so important from your perspective. Yeah, so um, my observation has been that over the last 20 years or so, and I guess that's kind of the length of time I, I feel like I've been in um, this field, I think we've done a really good job of in improving the public dialogue around mental illness. So we've uh, helped reduce the stigma around that. We continue to talk about it. We continue to encourage people to uh, get better at understanding if they or someone else is, is struggling and what they can do about that. Um, and then I think we need alongside that a kind of a complementary um, narrative around what do you do in terms of building your mental health maybe at the other end of the spectrum as well. So it's not just about treating mental illness and getting someone back to a neutral mental health point. It's, it's then about um, building a rewarding and a satisfying life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I feel as though this is, this is a project and a, and a vehicle through which we can have that conversation um, about how you build mental fitness, how you, how you enhance your life and the life of the people around you. Mm -hmm. And we can do that in this context with some fun and imagination as well.
Um, we get to, to bring in some other disciplines other than mental health. Um, and nothing against uh, mental health. Um, some of my best friends are, are mental health professionals. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's lots of other people, and I've discovered this on the project, like the, the, the lecturers that, 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 yeah. that uh, guide the students. Um, the students themselves uh, all have really interesting ideas and contributions to make to this discussion. Um, so for me, it's about turning that, that, that public dialogue around mental health into not just mental illness, but mental health, well-being, um, and yeah, the ingredients of a rewarding and satisfying life. And, and Chris, with that public dialogue, what, what are the main things from your perspective? Why is, gov why is it important for government to be part of that public dialogue? Um, I hope I made the point that mental health is not just a, a health concern mm. and it, it's not just a government concern. Mm. It impacts everybody in society mm. and the whole range of social determinants. Um, so it's important that we don't just say, well, this is a health department issue, so let's just use health department funding. Mm. It, it's every department of government contributes to the mental health and wellbeing of South Australians. Mm. It's every level of government, be it Commonwealth, state or um, local. Uh, but it's also uh, the public, the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so when you take innovation, that concept right through to commercialisation, then how do we take the output of Match Studio and go to a private company and say, hey, we've seed funded this, yeah. we helped them develop it, you've got a social conscience, mm. you've got a responsibility to chip in and get the commercialisation going mm. so we get the whole community mm. uh, and you see the government playing a leadership role rather than just purely funding mm. activities. And Jane, you're launching this on World Mental Health Day. We, we, we have to absolutely connect on that point. So tell us why it's important to launch an event like this on World Mental Health Day. What's the significance from the university's perspective? Well, I guess, I mean, we, we work with that percentage of the population yeah. who, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. mental health and wellbeing is, is really important to um, supporting that. University students, um, mm are a reasonably at-risk population, really. I mean, uh, it's not just study, it's the it's stress of, of life and generating an income and living and, and, and growing up and wondering, how am I going to contribute to society? Mm. I'm doing this degree, what am I going to do? So it's really important. The day, yes, it's a significant day, but really we should be looking at this all year round, and we do focus on it all year round, but it's just a time to really raise awareness of, of the issue. And Gareth, about the neuroscience, the research side, the, all of the you know, behind the scenes work that is so incredibly important, what, what can you say about the research side and the research community? You know, why is that important? Why do we need to pursue that in particular? Yeah, so there's, um, I think, a couple of elements to that yeah. question. One is um, that the information we are giving to students on which they're acting and, and building their prototypes, yeah. that we're confident that that has an evidence base. Um, and, you know, that's a, a really interesting process in mm. itself because as a, as a psych, when you're talking with students and you're giving them advice, you actually do have that voice in the back of your head yeah. saying, is, is the advice I'm giving actually evidence yeah. based? And you yeah. might have to go back and, and check that. Yeah. Um, so there's that side, so that the, the, the good science and good evidence is going into the information side. And then now where we're getting to the point where we have products that we may, um, well, actually not may, that we can mm. actually look at evaluating. Mm. So the card game, uh, let's deal with it, which we have copies that, that, that some people can take. Um, that's a card game that is intended to help explain some of the principles of cognitive behaviour therapy to a client um, and we can start looking at designing trials to determine whether or not it is a useful aid in that process. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of bookending I guess the process with research and, and, and evaluation, ensuring the information going in is, is robust but then ensuring that once we have a product um, that we continue to apply you know, some robust standards to looking at whether it works, um, to understand whether we can roll it out further and whether that would be a valuable thing to do. And, and Chris, what would you like to see in terms of researchers, organisations, government, key stakeholders coming together with the research collaboration for the benefit of all South Australians? 
Another concept that I was exposed to in developing a strategic plan, uh, beyond just listening, not just listening to those with the lived experience, is the concept of co-design and co-production. And uh, that is getting everyone, uh, the person with the idea, uh, the researcher that, that, that does the, the insights of the, the, the idea, the data collector that backs up and reinforces the idea, uh, the concept designers and commercial developers who, who take the whole thing. That's true co-design and, and co-production. And if we want to address mental health and wellbeing in our society, uh, we've got to listen to the voice of lived experience and then make sure they are intimately involved in the full co-design and co-production policy process from the very development of the concept through to, to the commercialisation of the product. And again, that's, that's what Match Studio did. It, it, took, it took a concept. Um, you have the students working with psychologists in a true co-design and co-production model to produce something mm. that can be commercialised. So it, it just aligns perfectly with what we're trying to achieve. And that's one of those intermediate stages is you, you, you come out with the prototype and, and then that co-design process can now include the end user. Mm. Yeah. So the, the version that comes you know, out two or three years afterwards is going to have had the contribution of, of all relevant parties to actually putting it together. Jane, do you have a final comment on that? Uh, that design actually really does make a difference. Yeah. Great. Mm. Speaking of voices, it's really a great opportunity now for you in the audience to ask questions or make comments um, based on what you've heard. A hand's gone up already, which is fantastic. We have people with microphones, so we have microphones on both sides of the room. So perhaps we'll start with this gentleman here. Are we on? Yeah. Three things since I've got the microphone. <laughs> Firstly, uh, I think what Gareth and Jane are doing is absolutely wonderful. It's absolutely cutting edge. I'm a clinical psychologist, I've done it for many years, and I haven't seen the like of this, and it is the design factor which is the difference. Secondly, Chris, in your statistics, uh, you gave very broad figures, but mental health is much more segmented than that. Uh, do you have figures in relation to other like subgroups? I'm particularly thinking of uh, migrant groups, the disabled, uh, indeed the, you know, the, the chronically injured, uh, and indeed, um, given the influx of um, foreign students here um, for them. And thirdly, if I may, and at risk of being a little unfair, um, essentially mental, the provision of mental health services for the greater part of the numbers you put up there has been subcontract to, to, to private practitioners. Now, there has been, apart from like a, a dollar or two increase since before t uh, 2012, about a dollar or two available, and also it's a discriminatory rate. Some people don't get as much as other people. So if you want to see a psychologist in private practice, I hope it's not an emergency because you can wait months. Now, I know that's not your fault, that's the Medicare system, but it, it, it's not quite as jolly as that sounds, I must say. Mm. Um, and that must be heartbreaking for you because Absolutely. what you're saying here is just magnificent, yeah. but it just doesn't work like that in the field. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, the statistics you asked for, uh, we have. I, I can't quote them to you off the cuff tonight, and, and that's understandable. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. Uh, it is in some way contracted out. It is to the private sector. Its majority is in the primary health network. Um, but uh, what we have to invest in is that promotion, prevention, early intervention, as far as I can see, uh, to prevent people reaching that point of crisis, as you say, where they need the emergency care. Um, I think we have to, in the clinical space, we have to look at alternatives. Uh, and so at the Commission, we're big fans of uh, developing a more professionalised peer workforce, um, that being people with lived experience who are trained uh, to, to go out and deal with a crisis rather than send an ambulance or a police car. Uh, you send a peer worker, maybe with a mental health nurse, and you try and resolve a crisis in the community uh, rather than putting someone in the back of an ambulance and taking them to an emergency department. If we constantly look for a clinician, clinical solution at that top end of the spectrum, uh, we're going to run out of money and we're going to run out of clinicians very, very soon. So we have to look at alternatives. And I think a, a qualified professional peer workforce of people with lived experience is, is part of that solution that we have to, we have to focus on developing. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Jane. Um, yeah. I have lived experience with uh, mental ill health. I'm a member of a suicide prevention network and I'm a local government counsellor. Mm -hmm. um, so my... Uh, and thank you, Chris, for a very uh, creative and innovative way of presenting it. It's fantastic. Um, my question is about tools and ways that you could um, help local government members like myself, elected uh, members, to be able to present to our councils the mental health benefits of strengthening our community through public art, cultural events. Um, I managed to get a policy up which got 25,000 a year. We've got 66,000 residents. We spend more than a million every year on sport. And there's no, no just, you know, the justification is it's, it's good for your physical health, etc. But I find sport can be problematic. It can, you know, there are a couple of teams who are going to be evicted maybe from their council because of bullying, competitiveness. Public art is amazing and it can actually strengthen the sense of belonging in your community, which I see breaking up quite well. I'm in an urban metro council. So I'm just wondering, are there any tools that we can do for local government, because we're close to our community, to try and build that sense through okay. creativity and public art? Sure. It's hard to get, it's really hard to get funding. Yeah. I'm happy. Um, yeah. it, it's Jermaine that you talk about sport. Mm. Sorry, you happy for Go ahead. Um, 900,000 South Australians play sport, and that's from uh, playing netball through to uh, music to dog obedience courses. Uh, and there's another 250,000 South Australians who are volunteers who support that 900,000. Uh, we've only got a population of 1.7 million, mm. so sport is a great way of connecting community. Um, but we recently held a, a one-day session with Sports SA and got over, Julia helped me here, over 100 sports uh, represented, um, and we talked to them about what are the issues that they're experiencing in their sports communities, um, but we walked away with options for addressing uh, the concerns they have. Um, things as simple as mental health first aid courses, but rather than every club having to fund training uh, someone to be a mental health first aider or two first aiders in their, in their club, uh, could the clubs come together and work together? And, <coughs> I think there's a role there for councils. Can, can you help them to coordinate their efforts around sports teams? Uh, my question is focusing, though, on tools that could help me to uh, present the um, benefits okay. of um, the, the mental health benefits of creativity, of creative projects and public art, because we don't have any problem putting money into sport. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it all the time. But it really was difficult for me to get $25,000 a year out of our council for a public art. Yeah. And, and that's, it's peanuts. Mm. And so I'm just wondering if there are any tools that we can use to help justify the financial um, input into um, culture yeah. and public art at a local government level. Yes. So I'm not talking about the fringe and all that, you know, I mean, that can be there, but for local governments, because it's really hard for me to get that money out of yeah. staff and um, elected members, but sport just walks in and gets it because they're a very effective lobby group. And yeah. I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but they get disproportionately, I believe, compared to public health, public art, which I think does help our sense of belonging and, and, and says something about ourselves. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there are any tools that any of you know. Okay. I'm happy to... Oh, yeah. oh, okay, we oh, might sorry. go to Jane. We might come back to Chris as That's well. Right. That's all right. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, art uh, does have a, a, a capacity, the ability to connect people and to start conversations that you might not otherwise have in other contexts. There is uh, opportunities. I think it's a combination of gathering the evidence, and there is evidence out there, but it's about uh, having those conversations with, with, the, with the people that do have that evidence and connecting those people together. There are some tools um, for communities to, to develop public art projects, but I, I understand entirely it's, it's the financial um, means to do, to, to do those projects that's a challenge. You need to, is the evidence, provide the evidence for the investment. Um, and I think that's part of the battle. We're not particularly good at providing that evidence yet. Yeah. Chris and Gareth, do you have any further comments to make about that? I think more that uh, you've just triggered me thinking about, so I each year we can develop the Visualising <laughs> Mental Health Project in, in a different direction, not in a different direction, sorry, but we can add elements to it. Um, and it just strikes me that 
one of the things that we, we managed to get up, uh, it was either this year or late last year, was the Visualising Mental Health website. Um, and the intention is to use uh, the, the blog part of that to talk more about the relationship between um, art and design and mental health, um, such that I hope that in one or two years the website itself would be a talking point um, and maybe cover mm. some of the literature that you're talking about. So it's not an answer to your question, it's more that I think you've given me something to, to think about um, that we could try and embed into the project itself. Could be a topic. So maybe come and have a chat with us afterwards about right. where the potential collaboration mm -hmm. there is. Can, can we have a microphone across here to... Um... Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank the Mother in the Making team. Uh, I work in domestic violence shelters doing art-based life coaching. And in 2015, people might remember the um, adult colouring books just became this sort of global phenomena. And in shelters, we knew about that for almost 20 years, that just having the simple practice of, of a sort of open-eyed meditation in the circle of conversation um, that was focusing just on stories and thinking about the future and sometimes the tears, but a very sort of um, almost like the old traditional village format, really. So I see that the Mothers in the Making project has enormous potential for women in shelters and probably in that, I'd like to acknowledge Helen Mayo House's work for um, mothers in postnatal depression over the years. And it's fabulous to see the art that at the grassroots has been used in many ways for many years that's now becoming more recognised. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, um, okay, we'll, uh, we'll come to you in a moment. Um, gentlemen here, we have a microphone and then we'll come back to you. Great, okay. Uh, about 14 years ago, I recall the flavour of the month was about parenting. In the, that, the input, those first five years that were referred to there, um, it was the flavour of the month, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, how much work has happened within the program so far looking at parenting as part of mental health. I mean, I, I can see one thing that's, but it seems to be focused on the, the, the well-being of the mother, but in terms of the parents and the role they play in, in parenting, which will facilitate better mental health. Want me to? Um, yep. So you're stretching my memory in terms of the various projects during the year, but certainly um, projects that focus on children are very popular. So we get a lot of uh, storybooks, uh, apps, games, um, uh, even products. There was a, a, a system that um, produced a projector system, a nighttime projector system that put stories up on the, on the ceiling as a child was going to sleep. So the age range, that child age range is very popular. And then increasingly what we're trying to do in those projects when we talk with the students about the project is ask them what features or what additions or what um, other components could you add to this that engage the parent in this process? Mm. So if it's an, an app or something, it's a game, there's, there's some way that the, the parent can engage with the child um, in that process. So there's some kind of co-play. Um, if it's a, a story, there's actual encouragement or maybe materials for the parent that help uh, explain to them what the underlying themes in the story are um, and why they're important. Uh, so it's a very popular age range and we do yeah, regularly as part of um, mentoring the students, ask them to think about how are you considering parents in this process, um, in, in how the child actually interacts with that product. Mm. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can remember um, back in the 1970s, it's probably re fairly recent history, <laughs> that, you know, as a kid riding my bike, bikes around the, around the streets, yeah. and, you know, the parents would all just be, you know, ringing each other saying, let's get them in now sort of thing. <laughs> it's only 40 years ago. Um, the issue of loneliness and disconnectedness is, becoming, is a real cancer in our society now. It's ridiculous how bad it's become. Is there a call to action? Um, that that can be given to us as a society to say, look, we, we're not actually sure what's actually happened. I don't think I can identify what's actually happened to cause this disconnectedness, but is there a call to action that, that we could actually start to, start, a message that we could start to get out to try and change, uh, change the culture a bit? Chris, I wonder yeah. if you have something. Um, 
certainly, and uh, no more. This is the greatest number of people are connected to the internet at the moment. Yet the strongest message is that they will only. I think what attracted us to, to Match Studio is that it's about trying to take that phenomenon of the internet and social media and applications and how do we use that for good rather than just say it's a cancer. I mean, it's there to live with now. Um, and yeah, kids aren't out riding their bikes on the streets before dark and what have you. But how do, how do we turn something that, that is obviously dominating our society uh, into something that's good that we can reach out and use to enhance wellbeing um, and, and awareness. And I think that's what you see in, in the Match Studio, uh, you know, the Monster app and uh, all the other methodologies that use that technology as a, as a positive tool rather than say, yeah, the kids are all locked on the screen and they don't go out and they don't get connected. So mm. um, you can either say it's a scourge or we make a benefit out of it, I think. Jane and Gareth, what, what are you noticing about loneliness and the interface with your worlds from the work that you do? Well, I'm not lonely. I spend my life with hundreds of students. So, um, But, um, look, it is a topic that does come up and, and over the years students have, have uh, addressed that uh, within the concepts that they've developed. One of those is one of the prototypes that we've got upstairs, Top T. And it's about, you know, the intention was the audience that the students decided to focus on was older people and people in nursing homes or people in, in aged care. Just because you're in aged care and you, you're living in an environment with other people doesn't mean that you talk to them. Um, and so Talk Tea is intended to stimulate conversations that are little labels on the tea bag, the questions on the back of the tea bag are about... Um, stimulating conversations. I think, and this comes back also to the reason why we had the forum that we man, ran all those years ago that Gareth and I met at, I think that there's a lot of solo conversations or soloists out in society that are talking about these issues and maybe some ensembles, but there's no choir. You know, it, it, we need to join together rather than compete for the limited funding that there often is to support these sorts of issues and actually start to, to really rally together. Gareth, what comments do you have about that? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know that literature particularly well, so I don't, I, I don't want to speak out of turn in terms of um, uh, making any bold proclamations. But there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is that many of the products that students develop are tangible, handheld products that seem to create an interaction between that person and someone else. So there's been toys. Um, there are books, the books ask people to reflect on their relationships or the book um, asks another member of the family to contribute to it. So uh, a lot of the materials have in, embedded in them, I think, some very subtle sometimes uh, nudges um, to connect with people around them, not just the, the item itself. Um, but I'll, the other thing, and this is kind of maybe very separate from that, is this feels to me like a project where a research team who is doing work in the space of social isolation and understands that literature well and feels as though they've got a, ser a set of key principles that would really like to communicate mm. to a broader audience, mm. that this might be the avenue through which to do it. Mm. You know, come and have a chat to us. Each year we put up between five and six topics for students mm -hmm. um, and they pick the one that they want to work on. Um, and we keep some core topics that we do every year because they just generally perform well. But three of that five often change on a, on a yearly basis. Mm. So it seems to me like that would be a fantastic topic to bring in expertise who understand the literature base yes. and who have worked out what, their, what are the five things they would say to the general public if they had the forum to do it. Mm. Um, and let's give that to the students and see how they interpret that and see how they find a way to communicate that. We have a question at the back there and, yeah, go ahead. Hello, my name's Donna. Um, I think uh, we have had a recent call to action led by the students with the, the recent climate change strike. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering um, how much of an environmental focus might help us in the mental um, health and well-being area in terms of your future projects or, or I'm not sure what 
maybe there might have been some in the current ones, but Chris, you say that we need to live, listen to the voice of lived experience and also that the social determinants of mental health are a major factor that we need to consider. Um, I walked um, down King William Road to Parliament House and I saw lots of fabulous posters and um, they had all sorts of mental health messages on them. Um, and there was a real mixture of people, as many of others here probably noticed as well. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, yeah, whether the, the students are interested in this, um, working with Matt's studio and producing visual product that um, delivers messages for the environment that also will help maybe resolve some of their mental health anguish. Of course, I mean, same sort of response, I, I guess, to the, to the previous one. Yes, the, it's potentially a, um, a topic. Uh, there are, Matt Studio, I, I, I need to acknowledge that we work in a university where there are multiple opportunities for students to engage with, with these topics. So, um, and, and I know that my colleagues do address these topics with their, with their students, but certainly could very much likely that it will be a topic that will come up? Yeah, just uh, quickly, I know that the Australian Psychological Society um, this year is part of Psychology Week, which happens in November. I know a big part of their push this year is engaging young people to talk about the relationship between mm -hmm. um, climate and mental health. Um, and the Australian Psych Society is a, is a supporter of this project um, in a number of ways. Uh, so yeah, I would say that process has actually started. Um, certainly within my discipline, um, that is actually the focus of Psychology Week this year, is that intersection, um, young people's views on climate change and health and mental health more broadly. The gentleman here in the blue shirt. Oh. Yes, I don't know whether I've got the wrong angle or not, but um, there's a lot of elderly people who suffer from depression. I don't, I don't think it brought up much tonight, but we live in um, a retirement village and they've got everything there that one could need. But it's been said that many times, it's only a small one, 130 people, but you've got 130 personalities. And not everyone just thinks the same. And um, a lot of them get to a stage where <coughs> If they by themselves, they just uh, don't involve themselves with anything, and before long they fall into a uh, depression. I've been in depression many a time, but my, I, I've been to see people like yourself. But the last four years, I've been reading a book called Courts in Miracles, and um, they. It, we all live in illusions of what how we present life. And, um, it just shows you the way. And of course, it helped me a lot over the last four okay. years. And I think I've overcome my problem. But I do sympathise with a lot of people talking about children. But we visit nursing homes as well. We, we have friends. And um, there are a lot of people in nursing home. They, they try to motivate them, but they fall into depression. Mm. Yeah. And it's hard to get them out of it. Mm. Yeah. That, thank you very much. It'd be, good, it'd be good to hear from Chris or Gareth about any reflections on that. I totally agree with you. And um, that's a very important part of our community that gets mm -hmm. disconnected. So we've got to look at how do we, we not rely on that community to be by itself and how do we maintain that connection with the rest of the community. And I don't know if, how many have seen that recent TV show where the kids went inside the mm -hmm. retirement village. I mean, if you ever wanted a perfect example of how you reconnect society, mm -hmm. yeah. that was a classic example. And, and I'd love to see more of that going on. Uh, imagine having an after school care facility beside every retirement village. <laughs> Um, wouldn't that be tremendous? But that's the sort of things we do have to develop. But we also have to work out uh, how can we reach out to those people in retirement villages 
what, what impacts them, what raises their awareness, what rejoins their community. Um, so we're certainly not ignoring um, our elderly people, but we just need to know what your lived experience is and, and how we connect you as a community. I think on the plus side, um, from the, the perspective of the project, I would say this year we have the largest number of student projects that have been focused on 50s, 60s and above. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the two products that are actually in testing at the moment um, is the TOC T, which mm -hmm. is around uh, fostering conversations. The initial test site is to uh, look at aged care homes. Um, and getting back to a, an earlier question, which is what have I noticed in terms of the shift in the project over time, has been um, students actually moving beyond their own age range um, in terms of their projects and, and thinking at either end of the spectrum. So I, I'm pretty hopeful with this project that we'll actually see more and more uh, projects um, in older Australians as mm -hmm. well as um, the little ones. That's about all we have time for now. So please join me to thank Jane, Gareth and Chris. Thank you everyone and Chris, thank you so much for joining us and for your wonderful presentation and for your support of the Match Studio and also the University of South Australia. Um, we really do appreciate that. Um, Jane and Gareth, congratulations and well done on all the work you're doing with Match Studio. And, so, and to all the wonderful students who are across the room and congratulations again to all of you for all your fine work and commitment and keep going, keep staying strong and resilient and you know out into the real world as we <laughs> head out and graduate. Nicholas, thank you for joining us tonight and also for the brilliant work that you are doing as well. And we'll hear more from Nicholas later in October, so wait for that moment. That will come out on the Hawk Centre. Um, yeah. Sorry, I do need to mention that um, a reminder that the video of this presentation will be available on the Hawk Centre website next week and the exhibition will be on display in the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery until the 23rd of October. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, safe travels home. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.